Look at their game. I see where your priorities are. Good evening. Hope you're all doing well. Um, we are on the top of of Ksuvis Daf Kuf Yud. I'm at Aleph at a brand new Mishnah. We have a lot of uh, Mishnayas to plow through tonight. We're going to be learning until the second to last line of uh, of the of this Amud, of this blot. And then tomorrow is a beast of an Amud, and we're going to have to minimize, unfortunately, minimize our dialogue over the next two nights because we literally don't have time. So we're going to get moving. We're going to get started. We're going to move quickly. If I say something that's unclear, call me out. Uh, otherwise, we're going to plow through. Says the Gemara on the top of Kuf Yud, Ahmed Aleph at a fresh Mishnah. Hamotzi Starchov al Chaveru. Ruvain says, Shimon, you owe me money. Bahala, Shimon responds, Bahala Hotzi Shemachar Lavasasada. He says, What are you talking about? You just sold me a field. So says the Gemara in such a case, Admon Omer, Yochel Husha Yomar, Shimon can say back to Ruvain, Ilu Haisi Chayavlach, you pulled out a star to say that I owed you money. If I really owed you money, Hayelachali Hiparea es Shelcha, Shemachar Talisasada. And it should have been the case that when I started paying you for the field, you should have taken my money and not given me a field. If I really owed you money, then it can't be both. They can't both be true. So what's going on here? That's what the that what Admon says. The Chachamim Omrim, no, that's not correct. In other words, Shimon can't argue that Ruvain uh, that he doesn't owe Ruvain money because maybe say the Chachamim five lines down. Brilliant. The Mishnah says in the name of the Chachamim, the reason why we still believe Ruvain that Shimon owes him money, even though Ruvain sold a property to Shimon afterwards, is because maybe Ruvain is basically guaranteeing that he'll have a property from which he, from which to collect. Shimon, we don't know, maybe he'll hide all of his properties in the Caymans and he'll have nothing in his name. But when Ruvain sells this property to Shimon, Ruvain knows one thing. Shimon has one property and Shimon owes me money. And it's basically a clincher that Reuven will be able to take him to Bezdin and say, this guy owes me money. Brilliant play by the Chacham. Asks the Gemara, my time at the Rabban. And why is it that the rabbis are saying what they're saying? Shapir Ka'amar Admon. It's still a good svara that Admon is saying, even if he's not right. It's still a good svara. So says the Gemara, <coughs> you're right under certain circumstances. In a case scenario where people give over money first, <coughs> and then the star comes second. Then he can then argue, Shimon can argue back to Ruvain. Everyone agrees. When the money's handed over first, and Shimon says, if I really owe you money, and I gave you money before the star, then just take my money and say, get out of my face. You owe me money. Oh, so that, so Admon is saying a good thing. So this says the Gemara. Yeah, it's true. When money is given before a star, then I agree with you. Keep pligi. When is the machlokas of our Mishnah? That's only ba'asra the kasve shtara first, and then v'hadar yavizuze, where the star is written first. And Ruvain had to agree. Yes, I'll sell this to you. They write up a star. They get it notarized. Everything is ready to go. Under those circumstances, that's where we have our machlokas. Admon savar. Admon is of the opinion. He should have said openly that this was his plan. No way. That makes no sense. Because chavrach, your friends, chavre isle. If I tell someone that Ruvain says, really, I don't even want to sell you this property. But it's the only guarantee that I'll get paid back. Because when I sell you this property, I'll know you at least have one property. So he says that the, the Rabbanan say that if uh, Ruvain starts to tell anyone that this is the reason why he's doing this ruse of a game plan, so then people will find out. Like people will talk. And that's the machlokas between the Chachamim and Admon, only in a case scenario where the star comes first and the payment comes after. I'm doing a, a bris coming up. The family said, can I pay you now or should I pay you after the bris? So I said, pay me both. It's fine. I don't mind. It doesn't matter. For me, it doesn't matter. But here the Gemara is saying there's a huge nafkamin in our Mishnah. Why? Because the nafkamin is if you get paid first, here's money. Ruben's like, thanks, you anyways owe me money. But if the star comes first, then the money is only responding to the star, and that is a little bit different. That brings us to our next Mishnah, a quarter of the way down on Kufiyot Amadal. What about Shnaim Shotziu who starcho ze'alze? You owe me $100, and I owe you $100. You owe me 1000 zoos, and I owe you an equal amount. So what do we do in this case? Admon Omer, Admon says, Idu haisi lecha, mimeni. You can't have it both ways. If in fact I owe you money, then how is it that you borrowed from me? Why would you borrow from me if I owe you money? Same amount. It's the assumption of the Gemara. It's the same amount. Yeah. It's the assumption of the Mishnah. So let's say you, I, you, know, you owe me $100 and then I ask you for a loan. 
Why would I ask you for a loan? You owe me money. It doesn't make any sense. So that's what the Gemara says. But Ardmon argues that you can't have this case scenario because there has to be a chronology where one person borrowed first and then the other person borrowed second. So but it, doesn't, it doesn't work out this way. That's Admon. I disagree. That everybody needs to still pay. They have to go through the motions and each of them have to pay that transaction. The Gemara will question the strangeness of the sheet of the Chachamim. Why am I giving you $100? And you're giving just, it, it's math. 100 minus 100 is zero. Just call it, just call it even. Why are we doing this? Itmar, the Gemara opens a third of the way down, four lines before the wide lines with a machlokas and the Amor Roy. Shnaim shehot siyu hushtar chov ze al which is actually a quote of our Mishnah. There's a machlokas. Rav Nachman Omar ze gove ze gove. They both collect. That sounds like the Chachamim. Rav Shesha Samar, hafuche matarta lamali. Why are we making things difficult? Just leave it be. Just leave it be. <laughs> this is all within the Chachamim, which is that everybody has to collect. And within the Chachamim, Rav Sheshis is like, everybody stop. This is ridiculous. I'm going to take two quarters and you're going to give me five dimes. Just stop. Just stop. The whole thing is even. Says the Gemara, Rav Sheshis Amar Hafuchem Atar Talamali. And then the Gemara says, Ella, what must therefore be? Zet Omeid Bishalo, Vizet Omeid Bishalo. Rav Sheshis says, in a case like this, within the world of the Chachamim, just leave it. This is even Stephen and everything is fine. And then the Gemara adds a qualification. This requires a little bit of a Yiddish cup. We are familiar with the fact that there are different qualities of property. Edis is the highest form. Benonis is the medium form. And Zibaris is the lowest form. And says the Gemara de Kule Alma, everyone agrees that if what I owe you and what you owe me are the same kinds of properties, Edis for Edis, or Benonis for Benonis, or Zibaris for Zibaris, Vadai Hafuchim Everyone agrees that that's simply flipping for no good reason. We have the same acreage of a property, same quality of a property, same value of a property. Says the Gemara, everyone agrees that in a case like this, it's even Stephen and let it be. That's for sure. And that logically makes perfect sense. So therefore, what must have been the machlokas in our Mishnah? The Gemara says, two lines into the wide lines, keep fligi, the is le lechad benunis u lechad zibris. We owe each other properties, but the only property that I have is a Zibaris property, which is garbage. And the only property that you have is Benanis. Now, here's the Machlokas. Rav Nachman, Savar, Zegove, Zegove. We still need to go through the collection process of trading. The properties are of different values. One is Benanis and one is Zibaris. And because one is Benanis and one is Zibaris, it's therefore worthwhile for us to trade properties. And really, more deeply, because this is a deeper layer, Rav Nachman says, Kasavar, Bishelo, Hain, Shaman. We determine the status of Edis, Benanis, and Zibris based on the relative statuses of your own properties. It's not held to an objective standard. It's just internal. Within your portfolio of properties, your best property, even if it's someone else's garbage, your best property is called Edis. Your second best property is called, it's called Benanis, and the third is called Zibris. It's always an internal check and measure of my own portfolio of properties. That's what the Gemara says in the name of Rav Nachman. It's Kosavar Bishalohen Shaman. And therefore, Asi Baal Zibaris, the Gavila Benanis. If I am the person who only has Zibaris properties, I'm collecting from you a Benanis. And that Benanis is better than my Zibaris, which makes it my Idis. That's what the Gemara says. To have a Gabe Idis. So now I have two properties. I started with a Zibaris. And when I collected from you the Benanis, both of my properties got bumped up. The one I got from you, which is a Benanis, is your middle one is my best one. That Benanis is now my Edis. And the Zibris that I had before is now a Benanis. And the other guy comes and takes my old Zibris, which is now a Benanis. And therefore, it is definitely worth trading because the value of what's being traded is not exactly the same. That's why our Mishnah says we have to still go through the motion. That's Rav Nachman, because we don't really, we don't really have a perfect symmetry between the properties. They're not exactly the same. And that's Rav Nachman. But Rav Sheshes, Rav Sheshes, Amar, do you have a question, Dad? Oh. Uh, actually, I do. Yes. I want to tell you something that's bothering me about this whole thing. You're talking about the quality of life. Yeah. Nowhere in here did it mention the size of the property. Correct. So that's bothersome because you might have you might have a half acre worth a billion dollars. Correct. You might have five thousand acres worth. Correct. Billion- As a general rule. Uh, when we are in cases like this, where the blaringly obvious is missing, it means we've made an assumption about the blaringly obvious. And in this case, it has to be that it's talking about even even values. It has to be that way. 
Otherwise, the case would not be right within the world of Chosh and Mishpat. Because if I borrow a thousand from you and you borrow 900 from me, you have a din in the Torah that you have to pay back the appropriate amount. I took Rebecca, my sister's kid, to, uh, to Great America uh, yesterday. In my head, from the beginning, it was a matana. Why? Because if it was a halva, then I cannot take a single penny off of exactly what I spent on my niece. I don't care. I'm not measuring. What, how much was the Coke? I actually measured the Coke. It was $5.20 for a bottle of Coke. That I measured. But that was only out of anger and frustration, but not because I care about the dollars and cents. So my sister at the end of the day said, thank you so much. My, my, my daughter had such a good time. How much do I owe you? I'm like, I spent around $95 on your daughter. In my head, matana language, right? But in halachic language, if that was a loan, I'm, I'm not allowed to do that. I'd have to have her pay me back exactly what we can be mochel, fine. But in general, so here, when we have the blaringly obvious missing, the assumption is that it's equal value. Your question, your question is your answer. <laughs> it, it, it still bothers me though, because Jamar is so specific about so many things and they just left it. Correct. They Correct. Just left it out. So the answer, that, that is something that's very true. And, and I, I feel that way all the time. And the reason why that's true is because we have not learned all of the Mishnayas in isolation. If we would have learned all the Mishnahis first in Maseches Ksubis, these questions would fall away because we'll, we would see a theme running through the Mishnahis. It, it, it's hard to learn like this because we're learning so fast and we're learning Mishnahis in isolation. But the real answer is that if we learned properly, and none of us did, if we had all learned Mishnahis by the time we were 10 years old and then we started learning Gemara, we wouldn't have even asked the question. But I hear you because I feel the same way. Like, how did you not talk about that? I've I've had that question before. It bothered me a little bit in this Gemara too because it's so important. Okay, let's jump into Rav Sheshes. Rav Sheshes Amar, Hafuche Matar Talamali. Why is it that he says that they are all even? Who says they're all even? Didn't we say that a person measures their properties internally? Yeah, but only Rav Nachman held that way. What is Rav Sheshes? Old Kasavar, halfway down. Bishel Kol Adam Hain Shaman. We always measure properties based not on my own internal portfolio of properties, but based on the market value of those properties. I don't determine EDs, Bainanis and Zippers based on what I have. The market determines it and it applies to my properties. And therefore you're trading a Bainanis for a Bainanis and therefore it's not worthwhile. So fundamentally the machlokas between them is whether or not we establish the status of properties internally within my own portfolio, internal relative one to the next or externally it's a set value. You know, we set the value of gold at X and it's controlled by the market. You want to change the value of X? Best of luck to you. That's not how the world turns. So that's really the machlokas here. The Gemara says, so, so, at the end of the day, ki asiyahu benenis denafshe kashakil. At the end of the day, if I give you a benenis, what am I collecting? The same benenis that I just gave you. And that's why Rav Nachman doesn't uh, care. Or the Rav Nachman, that's why Rav Sheshis doesn't care. Or the Rav Nachman, according to Rav Nachman, my, cha, Rav Nachman, my chaz is to asi bal ziburis beresha. The way to understand Rav Nachman was that first and foremost, the person who had the Zibaris property collected first. But how, how do we know that's true? How do we know that, let's say I, I own the Zibaris and you own the Bainanis. How would we know that I took your Zibaris first? Maybe it was the other way where I gave you my Zibaris and then the case doesn't play out so nicely. And the Gemara says in response to this, Maybe what we should have said is, Maybe we should reverse the case. And the person who has the Bainanis, he should collect the Zibris from the other guy first. And then he'll end up getting the same property back. So it says the Gemara, you're right, but we have to change it. We're make, creating a new Kimta. We're here, we're saying, you're right, but the guy who only had a Zibris property, he made the claim first. The Gemara says that that has no bearing. The chronology of when the claim is made doesn't change when the payment of the claims take place. Where do the payments of the payments take place? In Bezdin. It's all happening. So therefore, says the Gemara, so, so, eight lines into the wide lines. They're standing next to each other in Bezdin. And Bezdin says, okay, Karish, you're going to give him a Zibris and the Schwartz, you're going to give them a, a Bainanis. It's all happening right there. So what do you mean? There's a chronology to claims. And therefore, the Gemara rejects this, whole, this direction and says as follows. The case is a little bit different where one person has an Edis, an edis and a Bainanis and the other person has only a zibris. Mar savar bishelo hein shaman. 
According to the one who says that all the costs are relative, that would align with the sheet of Rav Nachman. And according to the sheet that says that we are Bishel Kol Adam Hain Shaman, that the status of one's property is objective according to the market value, there we would say that you are basically trading property for property. And if you look into each person's shita, you'll see that that's exactly what the Gemara means. And the Gemara here asks almost two thirds of the way down. It's not the Mishnah writes, wait one second. How can we have a shita at all that you're not supposed to trade anything? We've been working within the Chachamim. The Chachamim say, if we owe each other, we still need to trade. Rav Shesha says, don't bother. So it says the Gemara against Rav Shesha, Tanan, the Chachamim Omer, Zegove, Zegove. How can you say that you're not collecting anything the Mishnah says, black on white, the shita that you're explaining, which says to collect, you're saying, don't collect. Who are you? You're, you're an Amora relative to a Tana. You can't say that. So the Gemara says, Tir, listen to the language here. Tirgama Rav Nachman, Aliba de Rav Sheshes. Remember that the question was on Rav Sheshes. Rav Nachman, who's the Bar Plugta of Rav Sheshes, is answering for Rav Sheshes. Right? So Rav Nachman says, on behalf of Rav Sheshes, Kigon Shalava Zele Eser Chamesh. Now a different, a different case scenario. What's the case we're talking about? Yes, we both loan to one another. And yes, we both loan the same amount. However, the terms and conditions of the loan were different. I'm giving you $1,000 with a 10-year payback. Not even a 10-year payback. I don't have to pay back for 10 years. Forget about monthly. I don't have to pay back for 10 years. You gave me a loan, but I have to pay it back in five years. Okay, that's a different case scenario. So then says the Gemara, hey, chidami, what's the case? Ilema rishon le'eser v'sheni l'chamesh. If you want to say that the first person's loan was a 10-year loan and the second person's loan was a five-year loan, so then beha lema admon, then can admon possibly say, ilu ha'isi chayav l'cha ketzer atalova mimeni? How can admon in our Mishnah ever say, I should have just taken your money? After all, he's not allowed to collect that loan yet. Halomata's money. So you can't even say that that's what's going on in our Mishnah. The case doesn't make any sense. We can't even read the words of our Mishnah properly if Admon is saying what he's saying, and if Arukimta is a 10-year loan versus a five-year loan. Because at the five-year loan, when I say, uh, you know, I'd like to take a loan from you, be like, oh, you owe me money anyways. No, not for five years. So therefore, all of Admon's arguments go away. Ella, maybe the case was reversed. Ella, maybe Rishon Lechamesh V'Sheni Le'eser. Maybe the first person had a five-year loan and the second person had a 10-year loan. Hey, Chitami, what's the case? my time of the Rabbanon. If, in fact, it was time to collect the loan, then why does the sheet of the Rabbanon make any sense? After all, it's time to collect the loan. Be'ide lo matazmane. And if it's not time to collect the loan, then lo matazmane in my time of the Admon. Manashach. Either way, this Ukimta is a very difficult Ukimta. So says the Gemara, uh, you're right. Let's finally, fundamentally understand what's going on in our Mishnah. It's on the day of the fifth year, and that's when you take out your loan, or potentially. People are willing to take out a one-day loan. People don't do that. Let's say you do penny stocks for a living. You uh, you have insider knowledge, which might be illegal, but let's assume it wasn't for the moment. You have insider knowledge. If you had $5,000, you'll walk away with 100% profit, but you don't have it. I know I'm supposed to pay back my loan tomorrow. Can I borrow another $5,000? Of course you're going to do that because you'll be flush with cash in, in just a matter of minutes. Absolutely, you should. But that's the answer. That's answer number one. The Gemara then co goes on to another possibility. Rami Bar Chama Omar, Hacha Biyasme Askinan, we're actually dealing with a case of Yisomim, a case of orphans where the father had died. Diyasme Migbagave, yes, it's true that the children can collect this property, but Agbuye Lo Magbinan Minayhu, but we can't take anything from them. That's a little bit difficult to understand. How can that even happen? After all, the Haze Gove Beze Gove Ktani. But our Mishnah says that Zegovah is Zegovah. If you're trying to establish our Mishnah like a case of Yisomim, Yisomim are a paradox in which they can collect, but you cannot collect from them. And if that's true, then our Mishnah doesn't make sense because our Mishnah said Zev is Zegovah. And if they are one, if they are one of the Baalei Cho and no one can collect from them, they're out of the running for our Mishnah. So then the Gemara gives an ex. Say that again. Under certain circumstances, we'll see that this isn't the distinction the Gemara is going to make is not about Kedola, but it's not about Kedola. 
But nevertheless, uh, it, it would be similar if it was a timing issue. But that's not, it's not a timing issue. So then the Gemara says, how do we fit in the case of Yisomim into our Mishnah if we also know Zegove Zegove? says the Gemara, because the words don't mean what you think they mean. Zegove, you're right, one person can collect. But Vize Ro'i Legabos Ve'enlo. The person who wants to collect from the Yisomim, he should collect. But because they're Yisomim, he can't collect which means that one Zegove means collect, and the other Zegove means you don't collect, which doesn't really sit well on the, on the language. And Rubba's like, uh, he's like, no way, I'm not having this. And by the way, we see this language of Rubba many times throughout Shas. I can uh, just roughly three or four times we've seen this phrase already. On my Rubba, stay chuvos padover, do your research. This is a good one. Rubba regularly says this phrase. You know, like those people be like, okay, I got two things to tell you. And this, this is Rava. This is like Rava's, uh, it's his parlance. He, he can't help himself. This is how he talks. <laughs> Bless you. And Echada says the Gemara, you don't make any sense. You're going to tell me the words means don't collect? Do you read Hebrew? This is like simple ABCs. You can't possibly tell me that the Okimta of our Mishnah means that Zegove is you should collect, but you can't collect. That doesn't make any sense. That's Chadam. The Ode. And furthermore, Ligbinu Ar Liasmei. There is a possibility of collecting land from a Yasom. They can collect and you can collect from them. Like who? Like Rav Nachman, Kid Rav Nachman. If the Yasomim collected Karka on behalf of their father, so the Gemara just gave this whole complex ukimta. It's really talking about Yasomim. And one Vizegova in our Mishnah is that, yes, the Yasomim can collect. The other Vizegova is the other Balcho who can't collect from, from the Yasomim. Rava is not hearing it. So Rava asks two powerful questions. And the Gemara says, Kashya, great question. And we don't really have a good answer to it. Um, and therefore, the Gemara is kind of struggling with this second ukimta. We have our first one, which actually works. Uh, the first one was whether or not you take a loan on that last day of the five-year loan. And the second answer was Yisomim, which was difficult. The Gemara says, wait one second. The Lukma, maybe we should establish our case. Maybe what we're talking about is where the Edim, where the Yisomim, excuse me, have properties that are Zibris, and where the Balechov have Edis and Beninis. The Azle Yasme Gabu Beninis, the Yisomim themselves can go collect Beninis, Umagbule Ziburis. And then they can give the guy Ziburis, because when you collect from Yisomim, you always collect with Ziburis. So then the Inami Bishal Kol Adam Ain Shaman, had it been that our case was talking about a case of Kol Adam, that the market value wasn't relative, but it was objective. Either way, you can still only collect from the Yisomim with Ziburis. So therefore, the Gemara is positioning another possible way of understanding our Mishnah within the camp of Yisomin. Says the Gemara, great idea. However, you're right, but it's only true if the properties were not yet collected. But once there is a grabbing of properties, then this answer would not work. So the Gemara concludes with two possibilities of how to understand the Chachamim. One is that a loan was taken out on the last day of year five. Do people do that? Do they not? The second is this case of Yisomim, where the Balechov have properties that are Idis and Beninis, and the Yisomim can collect that. But when the Balechov comes to the Yasom, he can only take Zibris, because by, by Yisomim, you can only take Zibris properties from them. End of that Mishnah and Gemara. Now it gets easier. It says the Gemara, Sholash Aratzos Lenisun, as it relates to Eretz Yisrael, it's broken up into three parts. Yehuda, the Eber Hayardin, the Hagalil. And let's say that you, the husband, or she, the wife, would like to move to another community. So uh, in a marriage workshop that I was trained in, there's this document that says his opinion, she has no involvement, his opinion, but she has involvement, 50-50 decision-making, her decision, but he has involvement, completely her decision. And in every marriage, you need to fill out this worksheet, this worksheet, whatever it is, who does the shopping, who decides about the guests, who decides about the finances, where are the kids going to school, how much money do we give to tzedakah, all these things need to be worked out, it'll minimize a lot of fighting. Now here, the Gemara is going to say, what happens if you want to move? Location, location, location. So what do we do? So it says the Gemara as follows, the Mishnah, two lines from the bottom. You cannot move from one city in one of these three locales, Yehuda or Avra Yarden or Galil, and move to another one. Ir here is considered to be a small city. Krach is considered to be a major metropolitan, a larger city. Aval but within one land, the last line of Kufiud says, 
You can move from one smaller city to another smaller city, or from one bigger city to another bigger city. That brings us to the top of Kufiyot Amid Beis. And the Gemara says, However, you cannot drag your wife to a community that's different in size than the one that you have lived in. If you lived in uh, Podunk, Illinois, which I'm going to tomorrow morning, by the way, if anybody wants to go see what Podunk looks like, I'll take a picture of the farm when I get there. Nothing happening there. You are not allowed to move your wife from a farm in the middle of nowhere to downtown Chicago. It's not right. And vice versa. Can't, can't go either direction, says the Gemara as well. You're allowed to move from a place that is a, an unpleasant, a non-beautiful location to a beautiful location. But of course, you cannot go in the other direction. Rashbag Omer, forget that. No, you can't move anywhere. You cannot move from the projects to a beautiful multi-acred home in the suburbs without Rishus. Every wife is going to agree. I'm not concerned. But you can't do it against her will. That's not the din. Why are we not allowed to move, according to the Rashbag, from a Neve Ra to a Neve Yafe? It's a little harder to live in the big city sometimes, as we will soon see in the Gemara. Says the Gemara, I don't understand. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's not, uh, yeah, for sure. No, no. There's a much bigger Shiloh if a lot is part of Eretz Yisrael than if a yard is part of Eretz Yisrael. And some of the posts can say that in a lot, you have to keep two days of Yantif. It's a big, it's a big machlokas. Lahar dinim that a lot is not so pasha that it's a regular part of Eretz Yisrael. Tell that to someone who lives there, they'll kill you. But it's a, it's a real, it's a real shaila in the, in the responsa and in the, in the contemporary post game about how to treat a lot in regards to two days of yontif. If you're going to Eretz Yisrael, don't stay in a lot for yontif. It's very, very, very complex. And you're dealing with Dine del Raisa. First of all, should you be putting on tefillin on the last, last day of yontif? Second of all, are you, are you allowed to, to cook stam? Can you cook for a goy? That's a big enough kamina. You're allowed to cook for a goy on the last day, on, on our last day of Yantiv. In Eretz Yisrael, it's nothing. You can cook for a goy. But if it's still Yantiv, that's Nisar Darabon to cook for a goy. You can't even invite a, a goy to your sukkah on Yantiv. You can't invite a goy for Yantiv because we we're not allowed to cook for a goy. The so bishel that's allowed. Korbanos. What? If one how it becomes Korbanos. On them, but we can't yeah. invite them. We can't invite them. It's not so simple. You want to make a cup of tea for a goy in your house on Yantiv? That's probably an Nisar Darabon. Because the, the, the heter to cook is only for you. So the Mishnah says, Bishlamami Krachlir, I understand. If you're moving from the big city to the to the small middle of nowhere, Podunk, Illinois, I understand. In the big city, you've got all of the amenities. That I understand. Ella, why is it that our Mishnah says me krach? My time. Why wouldn't a woman want to move from a smaller city to a larger city? Says the Gemara, eight lines down, the Rebbe Yossi Bar Chanina. How do we know that there's a downside to living in a big city? Because the Pasuk says, They needed a bracha to live in the big city. This was in the times of the second Beis HaMikdash, and it's not so pasha to live in the big city. We know that. You get people knocking on your door uh, right and left. You got uh, people throwing newspapers on your lawn that don't belong to you. It's, uh, it's harder. So there are downsides to living in big city. That's why people live in the middle of nowhere, because it's a little quiet. Rashbag Omer, that Rashbag had said that you can't even move from a less nice location to a nicer location, even in the same size city. Strange. My bodek kiddush Shmuel, the Amar Shmuel, shinoi veses, when a person's uh, schedule gets all changed up, tchilas chole me'ayim. It's bad for the stomach. Uh, the, the more you move around, the more you change your schedule, it's hard on the stomach. Kasu b'sefer ben Sira. There's a sefer called ben Sira, not for now. And the Pasuk reads, Kol yimei ani raim, all the days of poor people is bad. Says the, the, the book of ben Sira, ba'ika shabasas v'yamim tovim. Those days are good. So how can you say all the days of poor people are bad? Hare, we know Shabbos and Yantip is beautiful. Uh, we just celebrated like 47 of those days in the last 12 weeks. Not even, in the last eight weeks. Says the Gemara, Kiddush Shmuel. Tamar Shmuel, Shinu Ives, Tchilas, Chole Me'ayim. Same idea, repeat it again. Ben Sira Omer, Af Lelos. Even the nights are not so pushed for uh, for Anim. Bishval Gagim Gago. A Vesas is a, literally a, a time frame. A time frame or a season. That's technically how you would, would translate it. So says the Gemara, what does ben, ben Sira say? It's even worse in the big city. Because in the big city, uh, at night <laughs> at night you have Bishval Gagim 
gago, with the slants of the roofs, it goes from their roofs to his roof. And uvim marom harim karmo. And he has a very high elevation for where his kerem is, and that's not good for him either. Why? Mimatar gagim legago. When there's rain, it goes from the higher roofs. He lives in the lowest property. And umeafar karmo lekramim. And when he starts to put down some moss, some things to help grow his uh, vineyard, which is at the top. And there's a little bit of dirt. It blows all the dirt that's there. And it gets shoved off of his property and down to the other property. So he loses out there as well. Famous Mishnah and Gemara. Akol malin the Eretz Yisrael. Everyone is allowed to move to Eretz Yisrael. Ve'in akol motzien. However, not everyone is allowed to leave. Hakol malin Yerushalayim. If you already live in Eretz Yisrael, everyone should live in Yerushalayim. Ve'in hakol motzien. But not everyone can leave Yerushalayim. This is true in both directions. Husbands and wives are not allowed to force each other to move into places where they're not allowed, but places that halacha demands that they live there, no problem at all. So a wife can say, we're moving to Shalayim. And he has to say, okay, and we'll see what that, what, how this plays out in the Gemara. If a man marries a woman in Israel and divorces her in Israel, no sin law, mimos Eretz Yisrael. The payment, the denominations, the, the type of currency should be in the type of currency of Eretz Yisrael. If they got married in Eretz Yisrael and divorced in Kiputkia, and this is an important note, Kiputkia has a has a it's a more it's a higher quality currency. It's a very strong uh, it's a very strong type of currency. No sin lami most Eretz Yisrael we're mekel we give a we give a lesser version of the currency we give the shekel which is weaker than the Kiputkia. What about the converse? They got married in Kiputkia and divorced in Eretz Yisrael. No sin lami most Eretz Yisrael. Triple kula. In all cases, she gets money from Eretz Yisrael as her ksuba. We'll see why in the Gemara. Rashbag Omer, no sin lami mos kaputkia. In one of these cases, at least, a little hard to know from the Gemara what he's qualifying, but he's at least qualifying in one case that she gets the money from kaputkia. And what? Point of law was not a place. Rachel claimed it wasn't kaputkia. Whatever she has to make do. She'll, she'll have to go to it. But if the Gemara says that's what the Tanakama holds. Mm -hmm. As long as they had their feet in Eretz Yisrael at some point. As long as they either married and or. Uh, one, one or the other, then they can still give the Shekel. Now, uh, it says the Gemara, the, the, the next case, which is the next iteration, which is Nasa Isha bit Kaputkia, Vigirsha bit Kaputkia, then no sin Lamimos Kaputkia with no arguments at all. You can't give me a can't give me the yen when I live in America. Like that doesn't even make any sense. So you gotta, you gotta be reasonable. But the Gemara was pretty mako in that, in the cases of half Kaputkia. And, and it's not really normal. And we'll see why in the Gemara, because the, the currency of Kaputkia was much stronger. So if that's the case, why are we being mako with our tuba? That's not normal. Says the Gemara, Hakol Malin, that everyone can move to Eretz Yisrael, whenever we see the language of Hakol, it's always a language of added inclusivity. So what are we talking about here? Wow. That the Avadim should also move. There's a version apparently somewhere in the Tanoim that Avadim are specifically mentioned in our Mishnah. And if it is specifically mentioned in our Mishnah, then you can't say it's Hakol La'asuye Mai. You can't use that as the example if it is the Mishnah. So therefore, what La'asuye mean Hayafe Lenevei Hara to say that you are you should even move to Yerushal, to Eretz Yisrael from, to a lower location, to a lesser location. That's a big deal. You live in a gorgeous house in uh, Teaneck, New Jersey, and you're moving to a dinky apartment in Meishar. That's right. That's correct. Move to Eretz Yisrael. What does it mean that not everyone can leave? If there's an Eved who, uh, who ran away, uh, he ran away from his master. He, now he's here in Israel, but he really he lives in, uh, in some other country, in Syria. So it says the Gemara, Zavne Hacha, sell him here. Don't let him leave Eretz Yisrael. We need to keep the bodies here in Eretz Yisrael. The zeal. And then you can go back to your hometown. He's your Evan. You live in, uh, in Syria. Your guy ran over the border. Sell him here. Keep him here. He's not allowed to leave Eretz Yisrael. Machbed on the Evan. Uh, says the Gemara, Mishum Yeshivas Eretz Yisrael, because of simply populating the land of Israel. We had said, What is meant to be included by the, the inclusive broad language of Hakol as it relates to living in Yerushalayim, to say that if you lived in a beautiful house in Beit Shemesh and you only get the tiny apartment in Yerushalayim, that is a worthwhile move. What does it mean? Who is not allowed to leave Eretz, uh, to leave Yerushalayim? To say, even if you're moving to a nicer place, let's leave Yerushalayim, it's so cramped, there's so much more space in Beit Shemesh, there's so much more space in Beit Meir, I'm out, not allowed. 
And the language of Ein Motzin is used throughout the entire Mishnah for the sake of symmetry. The Gemara says, Tanu Rabbanon, who Omer La'alos, he Omer Shelo La'alos. He says, let's make Aliyah. And she says, no, thank you. Kofen Osa La'alos, not your choice. You're allowed to force her. Beim Lav, Tetzeb Eloksuba, goodbye. You're either moving with me or you're packing out and you get no money. What about the reverse? He Omer La'alos, she says, I want to make Aliyah. Behu, oh, this is me and my wife. Behu Omer Shelo La'alos, Kofen Osa La'alos. The husband should be forced to um, to make aliyah. Vim lav yotze v'yitain ksuba. Well, I mean, I do too. It's just not practical. We did live there for five years, but we'll talk later because I got to get through tomorrow, and I'm not done yet. So it says the Gemara vim lav yotze v'yitain ksuba. He's obligated to divorce her, and he must pay her ksuba. This is an equal two way street, no gender distinction at all. It's the same exact thing. Good. He omerts latzeis. She wants to leave Yerushalayim. Who Omer Shelo Latzes? And I'm sorry, leaving Eretz Yisrael. Kofin Osa Shelo Latzes. She has to stay. Vim Lav Tetzei Blo Ksuba. She doesn't get a Ksuba if she chooses to stay. Who Omer Latzes? Vim Omer Shelo Latzes. Kofin Osa Shelo Latzes. Vim Lav Yotzei Vitein Ksuba. Again, very very equal footing for the husband and the wife. The only difference is she actually gets paid money and he doesn't because she whatever she actually has a Ksuba. That's a different issue, but that's the only distinction. Nasa Isha. If he marries a woman, so says the Gemara, let's see, this was talking about using the weaker currencies versus the stronger currencies. I don't understand. Katani, we had learned, you'd given the leniency that in a case where they married in Israel and divorced in Kaputkia, that she gets the lesser form of currency, Alma Basar Shibuda Azlinan. Where was the Shibud created? The Shibud was created when they got married. That was in Israel. That's the Shekel. So therefore, Basar place Basar Shibuda Azlina. Five lines, six lines into the wide lines. A Masefa, however, the last line of the Gemara says that Nasa Isha Bekaputki of Girsha Be'eretz Yisrael and those in Lamimo Eretz Yisrael. The Tanakama had said that even in the reverse where the Shibud was created in Kaputkia, still gets Shekel and that's a Stira. Alma Basar Gubaina Azlina. So this is the Gemara's Chakira. This is found throughout Chas as well. Do we say that the finances are established at the time of the contract? or at the time of the payment, at the time of the collection of the payment. So here, within the Tanakama himself, he has an internal contradiction. The first part of his comment is that they got married in Eretz Yisrael and divorced in Kaputkia, and he said Shekel. What does that show you? Time of the contract. And then later he says they got married in Kaputkia, they got divorced, they got married in Eretz Yisrael and divorced in, they got married in Kaputkia and divorced in Eretz Yisrael, and he said Shekel again. So Stira, what is it? Is it uh, the time of the Shibu or the time of the Gubaina? The Gemara says, Omar Rabbah, we're just being broadly makel here. Why? The Tanakama holds that Aksuba is the Rabbanan. We pask in this way, Ladina, that Aksuba is the Rabbanan. And therefore, we're allowed to be makel on giving her the lesser of the currencies. What about Rashbag? Rashbag's not hearing it. Rashbag argued on the Tanakama. Why? Because Kasavar, Aksuba do Raisa. So the thread that is running throughout our Mishnah is that the Tanakama is of the opinion that the Ksuba is the Rabbanan, so we can therefore be Mekel with the currencies. And Rashbag is of the opinion that a Ksuba is the Oraisa, and therefore we cannot be Mekel with the currencies. We have to follow all of the appropriate rules. Tanu Rabbanan. We're halfway through the widest lines on Kuf Yudam Beis, heading toward the end. I will get you to Maravan time. Let's go. Tanu Rabbanan. Hamotzi Shtar Chobal Chaveru. If the contract was written in Bavel, then that's what you pay. You pay in Bavel. What if you just said, I'll pay you? I'll pay you 100 without a, without a currency, without a type of currency. If you bring out the contract in Bavel, then that's the currency we use. What about Kasubo Kesef Stam? It just says silver, but it doesn't say what kind of silver. Masha Yirtze Love Magbehu. Masha Ein Ken Biksuba. When it comes to the regular case of Star of a Balcho, the Love, the borrower, can, can take whatever he wants. However, when it comes to Ksuba, it's not necessarily true. So it says the Gemara, this line of Masha Ein Ken Biksuba Ahayo, what is that? Going on, says the Gemara, Amr of Masharshia Aresha. No, that, that line of Mash Enkin Biksuba was only talking about our previous discussion between the Tanakam and Rashbag. Mid Rashbag, we're trying to re remove Lafu came into Rashbag, Amr Ksuba de Raisa, just to let us all know that we don't pass in like Rashbag. Mash Enkin Biksuba, which is basically we always give her shekel. 
or we always give her whatever currency we want. It doesn't have to be the higher version of the Ksuba. Says the Gemara, Kasubo Kesef Stam, to live in Why don't we just say that it's specifically silver pieces? Why do we why, why are we saying you can take whatever he wants? Amrablazar the Ksib Bay Magbe. It has to be coins, can't be silver bars. The aim of priti, why don't we say that it's a, a priti, which was a type of coin? Amara Papa Priti Bikaspa Lo Abdi Inche. They don't make these kinds of coins in silver. It's like saying that the penny was made out of silver. No, the penny is made out of copper, it's made out of something else. So therefore, that can't be it. Tanu Rabbanon, we're going to start this Gemara, a very, very difficult and sad Gemara for us because we live here and not where we should. Uh, maybe for good reason, but still, it's a difficult Gemara to swallow. Tanu Rabbanon, Lo'olam Yidor Adam Beret Yisrael, Afilu Bi'ir Sheruba Ovdei Kochavim, Ba'al Yodur B'chutz La'art. A person should live in Eretz Yisrael, even in a city that's mostly mostly Ovdei Kochavim, and you should not live in Chutz La'art. Ba'afilu Bi'ir Sheruba Yisrael, you shouldn't even live in Williamsburg, even in a, in a place with, that's the majority Jewish. Shekol Hadar, that when a person lives in Israel, it's like he has a God. Strange language. Okay, not for now. It's as if you don't have a God. It says the Gemara, a lot of people, you know what we're learning right now? The Talmud Bavli. <laughs> a lot of people have lived in Chutz The greats. Moshe Feinstein. A lot of people lived out of town. The Rambam. Well, the Rambam called himself a chote. But uh, so here, so what, what should we do? El Olomar Lach What? Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu himself. He has a bit of a better argument, though. Oh, yeah. but, uh, El Olomar Lach. He also begged. We don't beg. Yeah, he tried. A for effort. El Olomar Lach. Kol Adar B'chutz Laaretz Kilu Ovei Levodas Oh, thanks. I feel so much better now. Now it's not that I don't have a God, it's that I'm worshiping other other or other religions' gods. V'chein b'david hu omer, we have a similar language, ki gershuni hayom mistapech b'nach l'as Hashem, le'mor lach, avod elokim acherim. Says the Gemara, v'chima amar lo david, did david actually say, lech avod elokim acherim? No, let's try our third version, and that is where we will stop today. El alomar lach kol adar b'chutz la'aretz, ki ilu oved avod as kochavim. It's not, uh, it's not good. It's not good. We'll get into a little bit, a little of this more tomorrow. And these are some of the very religiously political Gemara, Satmar, and all the. Okay, we'll talk about it tomorrow. Wishing you all a beautiful night, Michael. Back to the wedding.